Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, Rail Freight, Current Learnings from Coronavirus of Freight and the Next Step, uh, in conjunction with Rail Freight Group and Waterfront. It's uh, good to see so many of you on the line on this glorious day, uh, and hopefully uh, some interesting conversations to follow in the next hour. It's always a pleasure for us at Rail Freight Group to be walk working with Waterfront. We have a long association with them. Uh, this year sees our 20 Six, I think annual conference uh, which should have been in the spring and is now relocated to the autumn in whatever format that will eventually take uh, but we were uh, pleased to be able to work together on, on this webinar almost a preliminary for that conference if you like and we've got an excellent lineup of speakers today from DFT uh, from Network Rail and from DB Cargo. Uh, some housekeeping you are all attendees so you're already muted um, but there are plenty of opportunities to ask questions via the question function and the chat function, so please do send in your comments and questions. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time today for that discussion after our three speakers, so uh, please send them in uh, and we can get those into the, the discussion later on. Um, thankfully, this being a webinar, I'm spared for having to tell you where the fire exits and the toilets are, but obviously if your house does set on fire, please feel free to leave by whatever means you would like. It is, of course, curious to think that at the start of the year, when we were planning our conference with uh, colleagues at Waterfront, the world looked quite upbeat. Uh, we had a way forward on Brexit. Uh, the political turmoil of 2019 was behind us. We had a majority government, whether you like it or not, uh, we had one. And those of us who met in the torrential rain at the back end of February for the opening of East Midlands Gateway New Terminal uh, really could see a, a positive outlook ahead. Of course, at that point, coronavirus was already rampant in the Far East, and indeed there were some early impacts on shipping, uh, which were beginning to wash into intermodal rail freight, but construction uh, was running at a pace. Indeed, the four weeks through March saw a record level of construction materials moved on rail. How different it looks now. Hopefully coming out of COVID crisis, but with huge uncertainty still ahead across the economy. Some of the economic stats are frightening. Even aside from the loss of life, uh, we have 600,000 people more unemployed. The GDP figures were down by 20% on the previous uh, GDP for the first time in 60 years. And closer to home, passenger rail is operating somewhere at 10 to 15% of where it was. The whole landscape has changed for us. And yet, despite that, I'm ridiculously proud of what Rail Freight has done in the last few months. As ever, we've put our head down and got on with it, and we've delivered. And not only have we delivered uh, the day to day for our customers, we've gone beyond that with longer trains, increased loadings, new routings, and been able to manage flexibly with our customers the ups and downs of their services as the situations progressed. Talking to you today, I guess we are at 80-85% of where we would have expected to be at this time of year. And that's a remarkably good position in many respects. But of course, that means there's still 10 or 15% that isn't moving that we would like to see moving. And that, of course, has consequences across the sector. And there are further challenges I think we face, not least the uh, impending recession, but the structure of UK rail looking very different in the passenger sector. That's a seismic shift, and commentators better than me will, will be able to discuss how and where that will resume. But inevitably, that's bringing pressure on for cost saving and indeed for reform. And the Williams Review, which was supposed to bring those reforms, hasn't yet been published. Uh, so we're not entirely sure what direction of travel that will take. But reform is coming, change is coming, and we need to be able to respond to that. We also have a Treasury government who are keen on investment. They're looking for shovel-ready schemes. In my experience, shovel-ready often means road. So we need to think about how as a rail industry, we better articulate the case for investment, uh, particularly in areas around decarbonisation. And of course, we still have to face up to whatever the new trading arrangements are in January when we exit from the transition period on Brexit. So these are challenges that we face, and I'm sure will come up in the discussion today. But I equally note that Rail Freight is in a good place to handle those challenges. It's certainly seen an uptick in political support and indeed an understanding of what it does and why it's valuable. So it certainly uh, goes into those challenges in as good a place as perhaps it might be. 
We've got some great opportunities to explore these challenges and a number of different angles on those questions today uh, with the three speakers ahead. But before we do that, uh, could we have the first poll, please? Let's think of this landscape that we have. So you should be able to see that poll on your screen. How can government support rail freight in driving post-COVID recovery? You have four choices there. I'm afraid you've only got four. Um, you can put in the chat if you think we should have had other elements or uh, quite topics perhaps. Um, but if you can just spend 30 seconds voting, please. Capacity for the main freight routes, measures to improve investor confidence in the private sector, and increase grants and incentives to use rail. Whilst you're voting on that question, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the three speakers that we've got coming up. First up today is Bethan Stokes, who's the policy lead for rail freight strategy at the Department for Transport. Bethan, I'm sure, is known to many of you uh, who are listening in today uh, because she's been our, our main point of contact on rail freight for a number of years. She joined the DFT in January 2017, but before that had been working at the Office of Rail and Road, so has a long history in our sector. Secondly, we have Andy Saunders, Freight Delivery Director at Network Rail, who again, I'm sure, is no stranger to you. Uh, Andy has uh, he describes himself as a career railway individual. He's been involved in rail freight since 1992. So there isn't much about our sector that Andy doesn't know. And uh, amongst his uh, many roles at Network Rail, Andy leads the, the FNPO team, who are so vital to all of us. And our final speaker today is Catherine Oldale, Head of Strategy, Policy and Communications at DB Cargo. Uh, Catherine has been with DB Cargo since March 2016, uh, leading up a lot of their uh, comms and stakeholder engagement work and more recently uh, their entire policy agenda as well. Uh, so it'd be interesting to, to, take, to get Catherine's take on events later on. So we have the poll results in quickly and uh, it's a fairly, well, three-way split there, I think. Electrification of the network, capacity for growth on the main freight routes, and increased grants and incentives to use rail, all coming up uh, fairly. Capacity for growth on the main freight routes there, winning the poll at 36%. So very interesting background there, uh, almost a split vote. Uh, and something perhaps, Bethan, that you might be able to reflect on uh, as you talk to us now. So it uh, gives me great pleasure, Bethan, to welcome you uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Um, just check I'm on screen. Excellent. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be joining the seminar today um, and that the poll results have given me something certainly and I think Andy some some challenges, uh, things to reflect on. So it'd be um, really interesting to discuss those a bit later on. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah, delighted to be joining the seminar, um, not least because it's my birthday today and I couldn't think of a better way to start the day than be here on a virtual webinar. Um, it's been a particularly difficult time for many of us um, during lockdown as, um, on kind of on a personal level. Um, for me, it's meant juggling childcare and work. So apologies if you see a toddler pop up. I hope that won't happen, but um, just, just to warn you. Um, so I'm here to talk about some of the department's thinking on recovery uh, and I'm particularly, to he particularly, yeah, particularly keen to hear your thoughts um, as industry on how government can now support the sector through the, the pandemic and into recovery. Um, I'm sure I'll be kept to 10 minutes, so Maggie's excellent sharing skills, but if there are any other points that you feel like you'd like to raise and you haven't had time to today, um, please channel things through uh, either Maggie or um, please feel free to contact me directly um, after the session. Um, so I'm going to talk very very briefly about the overall impacts of COVID-19. I won't go into a lot of detail, Maggie's, Maggie's covered some of the points um, already. Um, and then I will outline how government has supported rail freight during uh, the crisis to date and then uh, set out some of the thinking on how government can support the freight sector to a stable recovery. And I think crucially here, it's about providing a clear and stable policy framework to instill that investor confidence um, in the rail freight market. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to emphasise that government absolutely recognises the important role of, of rail freight to the economy and the environment. And um, the COVID-19 crisis has only highlighted the essential role that the sector provides, um, plays in, in moving freight, uh, critical freight within uh, the UK um, 
in the eyes of ministers. Um, they're repeatedly um, raising these points with us officials. Um, in terms of the overall impact, um, government fully understands and completely recognises the, the significant impact that the current events have had for some freight operating companies and customers. Um, and ministers are extremely grateful for all the sectors done for keeping freight moving and supporting the UK economy during the, the critical period. Um, we know that construction and maritime intermodal, uh, which together account for around 50% of freight services, fell sharply in the first month of the lockdown. Um, and construction related freight services, for instance, were down by around 60% during April compared to the equivalent period last year. Um, but it is really encouraging to see those service levels recovering to around 80% compared to normal, uh, compared to normal for this time of year. Um, it's, however, uh, domestic intermodal services have actually been running at higher levels during lockdown period when compared to the similar period last year. Um, and uh, as Maggie mentioned earlier, so it's enc really encouraging to see the total number of freight services are now starting to recover and are operating at around 85% of pre-lockdown levels. Appreciate that's not a full 100% or even more than 100%, but it's, um, it's certainly encouraging signs. Um, and then the greater availability, of course, of network paths during this time due to reduced passenger demand and coupled with no additional barriers has meant that rail freight has played a vital role to support the essential supply chains and facilitate the movement of goods across the country. So moving on to reflect on what government's done during this time and what, what we've been doing um, during the, uh, the lockdown period. Um, the government put in place uh, a number of unprecedented financial support measures to help government, uh, sorry, sorry, to help businesses across the, um, the, the wider economy. Uh, this includes the government's coronavirus job retention scheme or furlough scheme, which has provided uh, essential support for jobs. Um, in addition to measures like deferral of VAT payments and um, other such uh, uh, contractual um, incentives to help business manage cash flow. Uh, the government has also made available uh, a number of loan schemes, such as uh, coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme. Um, and a number of these have actually been revised in a manner which, which has made them accessible to, to a number of uh, freight companies as a potential avenue for support. Um, in addition to this sort of significant, uh, I'd say, Treasury-led support, um, ministers and, and officials have been um, uh, working really closely with Network Rail, freight companies and trade associations, uh, such as the Rail Freight Group during this period. To understand uh, the in more detail the financial and operational pressures on the sector, the government's focus has been on providing assistance to industry uh, to help meet the challenges um, it's facing, and um, through those three categories of financial, operational, and then policy support. A lot of the practical things that we've been doing have been around sharing of um, uh, health, workplace, PP, and other social distancing guidance as well. Operationally, we've been working very closely with Network Rail to ensure that freight trains are crucially kept running and uh, particularly cri uh, around prioritising the critical services in the timetable. And I'm sure Andy will be talking more about this uh, in his se session coming up next. Um, we've also supported a broad ranging actions in respect of uh, financial pressures that the sector faces. Uh, Network Rail has set out a package of uh, measures to help address some of the freight operators' um, shorter term liquidity concerns around track access, um, payment deferrals and certain supplier payment um, uh, guarantees as well. Um, government has repurposed the existing Mode Shift Revenue Support Scheme grant uh, to allow payments to partially laden trains. Uh, so this has uh, supported cash flow and hopefully has helped ease some of the freight concerns um, at this time. And in addition, we have also agreed with Treasury support that Network Rail has been able to replace its uh, Schedule 8 payments to freight operators for a short term um, in, instead of uh, providing a fixed sum um, to give further support and stability. 
Uh, so moving on to recovery, crucially, um, this is going to be obviously the, the main main area of interest for this debate. Um, but we've moved we've moved away from some of the lockdown measures, of course, um, in the UK. And uh, as we move towards recovery, rail freight continues to have a, an important role to play. And we're really, really keen on working with the sector to identify those buckets of operational, financial and regulatory measures that we can um, pull together to help support rail freight. Um, rail freight, we know, emits 76% less CO2 compared to road haulage and therefore uh, has a really key role to play in the government's net zero 2050 targets and the green recovery, which remains an important priority for government. Um, government is now actively exploring a package of measures to support rail freight in the recovery space. So these include exploring potential uh, changes to mode shift revenue support grant, uh, also supporting Network Rail's efforts to work with the sector um, to explore opportunities to run longer and heavier trains. In terms of capital investment, the government has been very clear about its commitment to continued infrastructure investment to support recovery. As Maggie mentioned, um, we do hear shovel ready, but I think there's there's also uh, some recognition that rail schemes do take a little bit longer. I think that um, you know, the, the practicalities of the industry are, are also taken into account there. Um, but on decarbonisation as well, the Secretary of State has said that rail rail has a really key role to play in the decarbonisation of transport as a whole and has agreed to look at some early electrification schemes, uh, which um, could include, of course, freight schemes. Um, we are also actively exploring with uh, some of the FOCs, Network Rail and ORR, the issue of extending track access contracts for a longer term. Um, and we look forward to discussing the, the detail of that in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and we are also carrying out some initial research into the potential for other forms of grant schemes, so such as capital grant schemes, which um, it was interesting that came up quite high in the polls. So very much take that message. Um, so things like uh, potential opportunities for terminal development grants as well as uh, the, the revenue um, support through the mode shift uh, support scheme. Um, we are also keen to encourage innovation to help move towards a more decarbonised sector alongside the challenge of improving air quality, which is not, not an easy challenge. Um, but we are assessing the levels of government support for research and development in that space as well. Uh, and will continue to progress the transport decarbonisation plan during this year. Um, as I said, we are working extremely closely with the sector and have a really strong shared agenda, which I think is crucial at this at this stage. Um, we're really keen to support and at the same time, uh, a plea to encourage the sector to come up with innovative and practical solutions that we can um, adopt as quickly as possible. Um, government will be uh, we'll be very keen to continue uh, exploring any other steps that need to be taken uh, and keep those under close review. Um, so yes, I'd just like to end by uh, thanking Maggie and Waterfront again for the opportunity to talk today um, and to really re-emphasise government's recognition of rail freight's efforts during the, this incredibly challenging time for us all. Um, and myself and colleagues in the rail freight team at DFT committed to working closely with you um, to support freight's recovery. It's really important that we secure those uh, significant economic and environmental benefits that rail freight provides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethan. Um, it's uh, it's good to hear the. Uh, the support from government and also the very specific measures uh, that we're looking at and uh, you know as somebody who's spent a lot of time on the phone with DFT in the, in the last quarter you know we've equally been delighted with the level of commitment and support that, that yourself and colleagues have shown to, to rail freight particularly when you look at the scale of issues in other parts of the transport sector so so thank you to you as well. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in uh, we will gather them up uh, for a little bit later on, but please do keep them coming in. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker today, Andy Saunders, Freight Delivery Director at Network Rail. Uh, Andy um, claims he's got an IT problem which is preventing us seeing him in person. He is uh, 
online we understand on audio uh, i suspect just like the rest of us he hasn't had a haircut for three months um but um he assures me it is actually his wi-fi but andy thank you very much for joining us today uh, and over to you thank you thank you maggie uh, good morning and uh, and yes um, um thank you rumbled me that i haven't had a haircut for many months and therefore i'm, I'm too embarrassed to show it um no apologies you can't see me it's not it's not great um i have got some somewhat aging it which is due to be replaced uh, during lockdown and of course uh, i can't wait to get back into an office and actually collect my new uh, my new goodies that apparently are waiting for me somewhere in the waterloo area um thank you very much um it's good to hear the um the introduction from maggie and obviously um i understand um beth and thoughts from the department's point of view and um, some of what I'm going to say now will probably I hope uh, if you like um, validate what they've said because clearly we've been working very closely together so so from my own point of view speaking to Maggie and DFT and, and, and uh, freight operators and others has been something that I've been doing with regularity so um, it's been uh, it's been an interesting uh, period of time and I wanted to share my thoughts over the next um, seven or eight minutes in terms of what we've been doing network rail and look at that from both the sort of the past the kind of present and then looking into the future a little bit. So if, if we could move on the next slide, that would be great, please. Thank you very much. Um, so again, you know, the, the current crisis has been a, a real opportunity, I think, for the freight industry to to showcase um, exactly what it can do. Um, and I'm, I'm as a railway individual, I'm really, really proud of the way that the efforts of so many people and, and indeed many of you that will be on the on the seminar as well in terms of how that's been managed and how we've coped with in many cases working remotely and from our uh, freight end users and from our freight operators who clearly haven't a lot of them been out there driving trains shunting trains and dealing with everything else going on in the background so so it would be wrong of me not to say how incredibly proud i am of all the way that the industry has rallied together to to deliver what we have for the nation um, and i was reflecting over the past few weeks and i can't remember a time when when so many people have headed in the same direction um, for the same common good, putting their personal views and commercial and business confidentiality on one side as everyone kind of mucked in, um, you know, getting supermarket products to Scotland, biomass to power stations, household waste being moved around conurbations to make sure we didn't have any problems with that being left around. You know, it's taken a bit of a crisis to get this to happen. And I think what we need to do is to find ways to ensure that going forward and in the future, we undertake more of this activity and behaviours in, in a more kind of cohesive way. And um, so from the, how did this all kind of start from a, from a net or rail point of view? I think, you know, quite quickly, as, as Maggie said, I remember going home from Milton Keynes the first week in March and thinking, reading the news and thinking, crikey, this, this is all looking very, very serious. You know, we heard about China shutting down and, and how the uh, how then we realized that the, the ships coming across with intermodal boxes were were going to be delayed or postponed for a period of time and you thought this this really is quite serious yeah. so so very quickly working with um, our freight customers and end users we were quick to see that there was a something quite serious heading towards us so very early on we set up um, calls both regionally and and routes as I'm sure many of you are aware we have routes regions and routes in network rail and, uh, and it doesn't uh, doesn't surprise you probably that each region and each route had their own call. Uh, so of course some of those probably clashed. So trying to get a coordinated view that meant that we didn't have um, people taking calls at the same time, and we made sure that my team were dispersed across those calls to enable uh, a good share of information. When in those early those early days and weeks it was a little bit muddled as exactly what was going on, but very quickly we made sure we got that all organised and sorted out for our customers. And um, we have. Freight service delivery managers who are uh, individuals who work in the National Operations Centre in Milton Keynes. Um, clearly, that was uh, that was moved out and, and, and broken up during the uh, during the lockdown period, and we moved these individuals to remote locations so that they could carry on doing the day-to-day -day activities for rail freight. Um, because clearly, at that time, you know, operationally for around eight weeks, rail freight was the only show in town. You know, huge reduction in passenger services. Um, you know, there was an ability to to pretty much do most things with rail freight, and mm. and there were some very innovative and clever ways that we did that. I think, as Beth had mentioned, we focused very much on critical services. So it was those particular services that we'd work with the freight operators and end users to identify particular trains that were critical and, and key for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and and as Network Rail, we prioritised these and worked very closely with the sector to make sure that we delivered those on time and in a way when there was a problem and let's be honest the rail network has problems if it's like today where you are where it's very hot and i suspect there'll be rail temperatures like yesterday at heathrow up to about 43 degrees so very hot rail temperatures 
even though it wasn't a problem back in March and April, there are everything, things that go on every day on a rail network that we had to deal with. And freight was definitely prioritised um, beyond, uh, beyond really my expectations as well. Um, so during that period, as, as both Maggie and Bethan have said, there was a, a reduction in traffic and clearly that has had a, a, an impact on many of our end users and those commodities. So, for example, automotive, maritime, intermodal and construction being three that have, have suffered quite, quite much. And, um, and therefore, we were very keen to make sure we, we supported them. Um, and we did that by a number of ways. And, and clearly, that was a, a tough time in that initial kind of uh, first four to six weeks. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of what have we, what have we done when well, we realized that we got through that first initial um, bit of time, the focus then switched towards looking forward to how we could recover. Um, and again, then think that the focus switched quite a lot to, to work even closer really with freight operators, end users, rail freight group, department, transport for Scotland and rail delivery group in really seeing what do we need to do to get traffic running again, get the, the market moving in the right direction, and also how could we help in making sure that the, the ability to run longer trains, where we had lengthened a number of trains, how do we kind of keep that going? Um, there's currently a lot of work on going at the moment with um, the um, department and the ORR and our customers looking at exploring the track access contracts and whether we can extend those. Um, velocity and increasing the speed of services is one that is a particular challenge and can only really happen twice a year with the timetable change. And we're, we're going to start a, a, a small working party to see how we can speed up a number of those trains. And the one I was going to focus on for a little bit longer that, uh, that Beth and Anne, Maggie made reference to is the longer and heavier trains. So currently we've got I think there's about eight head codes um, for Freightliner and DB where we really have gone beyond it. We have a what's called a service plan review, which many of you will be aware of, where we add sort of the odd wagon here and there to try and uh, increase and better the economics of trains by looking to lengthen services on particular flows. What I'm talking about here is actually long, making trains longer and heavier by a substantial amount. So, for example, um, we've got a couple of intermodal trains for Freightliner today running between Southampton, the Northwest and the West Midlands. Top in, you know, getting towards 750, 775 metre long, which is absolutely fantastic. You know, we've 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 invested, the government has invested a lot in in that particular corridor to West Midlands for those longer trains. So I'm very keen to ensure we we see that continue. Um, but of course, with uh, with the way that's been made to happen during the last eight weeks, is those trains have run in parts of or parts of paths that passenger services, which are currently not running, would have occupied previously. So now the challenge now is to see how we can uh, utilize the timetable and do some some clever stuff to see how we can continue to get those trains running. So there's a detailed piece of work going on behind the scenes, working closely with Freightliner and DB and, and my colleagues in capacity planning to understand how we can see where those conflicts are. So for example, if there's a Freightliner train that has a problem in the Leamington area because there's now a, a returning um, West Midlands train service, for example, what's that head code? What could we do to, to perhaps flex it by a couple of minutes? Is there anything clever we could do in that space? Um, and clearly there needs to be an industry proposal for doing that. Now, what we're going to see with that, that piece of work is actually going to demonstrate there are some trade-offs required, and it's going to be quite an interesting discussion to be had with a number of parties to see how, if we really, really want to continue those longer trains, what do we need to do to make that happen? So, so for me, that's a, that's a key area where all the parties will be working together to see how we can do that, um, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing to see. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So in terms of the the future, um, I guess what does this kind of mean for the the, the 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 kind of new normal as people call it? And and certainly I'm very very keen, as many people on this call and and those behind the scenes have said, not to lose the momentum and collaboration that we've built up over the past three months. Um, as I said earlier, there's never been I don't think in my in my somewhat long career in the railway, I don't think I've ever seen such a close working relationship with with many parties, not just within the the rail freight operators and the end users, but also with government opinion formers, when we've all been heading in the same direction with the same common goal. And it's very important we don't lose that legacy and lessons we learn. So certainly within network rail, very, very keen we increase the regional engagement. I mean, when I mentioned earlier about the, the priority of trains and making sure that, that freight was prioritised, um, I want to make sure that we get that kind of focus and that headline into the regions in, in a way that we've been aiming to do for the last couple of years and we haven't necessarily succeeded and I, I'll put my hand up for that one but we need to make sure that with the current position we have is that we continue to build that collaboration and when thing needs, things need to be done in a positive way we sort of 
can try and find ways to reduce the bureaucracy and red tape and actually make sure we, we get done things done much quicker. I think we understand, we need to understand, as I mentioned about longer and heavier, how do we push those boundaries to, to, to make longer trains something that's more the normal rather than perhaps the exception. Um, and also I think as, as Bethan has certainly said, and I know that Maggie has alluded to as well, is that we also see how from out of this crisis, we can have a, a clear strategy with DFT and Transport Scotland as part of a long-term solution to both move goods by rail, but also to help solve the decarbonisation challenges that the UK faces is over the next 25 to 30 years. Um, I was going to end by just sort of saying, I think we've learnt a lot over the last couple of months. I think we need to kind of articulate that. We need to think and reflect on how we can all play our part in continuing that. Um, and, and really to say that once we escape the clutches of COVID, I think the future is looking bright for rail freight. It's not going to be easy and intermodal is going to take a lot longer to return. But I think the main message is that as Network Rail, my team are very here to remain to support our customers, end users in the sector and work together to see what we need to do to promote that modal shift and to promote further growth. growth, growth. Um, and I want to say I'm passionate about keeping that collaboration and can-do attitude going. And thank you very much for listening. Andy, thank you very much. That's really, uh, really interesting to see um, the work that you've been doing and uh, and your slides as well, uh, even if we couldn't see you. So thank you for that. And again, you know, tremendous work being done by uh, your team and colleagues um, and some challenges there, I think, for the future, not least around regional engagement and how we can keep collaboration going when uh, we get back to, to business as usual. Um, so um, moving on then to our final speaker, Catherine Oldale, uh, Head of Strategy Policy and Communications at DB Cargo, uh, who leads uh, all, has been leading their response to the virus within the business and is going to share some thoughts uh, from an operator's perspective with us today. Catherine, thank you very much and over to you. Hi, thank you, Maggie. Thanks for that. Um, thank you to Maggie and thank you to Waterfront for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, yes, my name is Catherine Oldale. I'm Head of Strategy, Policy and Communications for DB Cargo UK. And what I wanted to do today was share some of the learnings we faced from the current pandemic and where we've been able to shift how we work and turn a current crisis into a success for us internally. Just move my slides on. So first and foremost, um, the, our management of the crisis has been about people. So the pandemic has been absolutely about people and our ethos has been if we look after our people, our people will look after the business. And that's exactly what we've seen. We have been able to build stronger and more collaborative relationships, both internally and externally with our colleagues, with our customers, with our stakeholders and with our trade union partners. And throughout the past 12 weeks, we have seen a catalyst for change to deliver improvements which previously would have been absolutely inconceivable or certainly would have taken years or months to implement. So what do I mean about people and managing our people? And this has been for us about putting people first. So our strategy right from the start was to keep our people safe and implement government guidance as quickly as possible. And that has meant that we have a number of colleagues who are at risk and vulnerable and where they can't work from home, they are still at home today and are there until further notice. We have taken advantage, as most of the UK businesses have, of the furlough scheme. But in order to avoid unnecessary uh, confusion or concern or being unsettled, we've chosen to top up their salaries from 80% from the government to 100%. This has really been about looking after our people to look after us and our business. Communication for us has been absolutely key throughout this crisis. Uh, we, for any of you who know about our business, we have a very large and very disparate workforce. So making sure that we have the tools and the techniques to keep our people in touch with developments, um, changing guidelines, and our approaches to that has been absolutely key. So following every government guidance update, we've produced concise and timely updates, we've been as transparent as we can be, and we've also looked at what this means for our people and what we're doing to keep our people safe. 
So we have increased use of basic things as hand sanitizer, desk wipes, um, and communicated those effectively. To avoid any, any confusion or concern, we have created a dedicated app page on our internal app as a one-stop shop for people and their information they can go to. Everything is there in one place. <clears throat> Having a very large and disparate workforce has, it, has its own issues and um, we've had to look at different ways to engage and motivate and stimulate our people, particularly through our communications channels. Um, so we've had to employ various different types of media, such as videos and other technologies in order to do that, because you want to keep people um, up to date as far as possible. Um, we've also put an awful lot of trust in our colleagues to stay safe and to keep their family safe and to keep their colleagues safe and thankfully I can confirm that we have been very lucky actually we've been relatively untouched by Covid, Covid related illness and Covid related symptoms so our people have been, we, we've created the conditions to keep people safe and people have also done that, they've looked after themselves, their families and more importantly to us, their colleagues we, when we've been talking to our colleagues, we've had to change our tone. <clears throat> That's been something that we've never done before. We have at DB, we have a clear and consistent corporate message strand, which we employ, and we've had to soften that. And that's been a big shift for us. We've had to take on a more human, more caring approach to that. Um, and that's something that you may have seen on our social media channels, on our press releases, and particularly in the key worker loco that we unveiled a couple of weeks ago at Toten. That symbolised, recognised and celebrated everything that key workers are doing in the UK, so a community that we are very much part of and we're incredibly proud to be part of that key worker community. Just moving my slides. There we go. So <clears throat> everything that we've done so far has allowed us to strengthen the relationships that we have and is preparing us for, as Andy just mentioned, our new normal. And that is what we're calling it because it is our new normal. So what have we done and where has it taken us to? So throughout the past 12 weeks, we have been able to build better and stronger and more collaborative relationships with our trade union partners. And that's primarily because we've had one common goal and that is to protect our people. So what we've done is we've been able to identify obstacles and work together to find solutions that keep our people safe. We are strengthening that relationship for the future and both sides have done a great job at that. We've also been able to make and implement new business decisions. I suppose, what, what do I mean by that? And this is the really exciting part for us. And Bethin and Maggie and Andy have already alluded to these things, but let me tell you a little bit more. So six months ago, if anybody had mooted the idea at DB that we would all work from home and that we would run all of our trains from bedrooms, kitchen tables, dining rooms, back bedrooms, we, we would have been laughed out of the room. But actually, that is what we're doing right now today. We are running every single one of our trains from a kitchen table, from a bedroom or a dining room. And not only that, not only are we running all of our key service trains, we have run longer trains and heavier trains, and we have run trains on peak passenger paths through the channel tunnel. That is an amazing feat. So we have kept all of our services running where we can, where our customers have wanted our services, but we've also flexed how we work. We've adopted and changed how we work to meet the changing needs of our customers and our business. It's absolutely amazing what we've done. And we've been able to do this because we've been more efficient. So we've had more time and we've had more technology. We are all now as a business enabled technologically to do this. And for DB, I cannot, you cannot underestimate the significance of that, the significance of us all being technologically enabled to operate our business remotely. It, it's a huge feat for us. Like most of the business now in the UK, we're now uh, operating predominantly through Microsoft Teams as our primary communication channel. So that's what we're using to talk to people. But what it means is that we're not traveling up and down the UK as managers anymore. We're now able to be better 
connected to our colleagues and to our customers and to our stakeholders. So we are more efficient. We have more time to be efficient with uh, our resources and uh, our customers. So, <clears throat> so as a consequence, we've been able to look at our internal policies and our practice and procedures and look at what is ripe for reform. And this links back to what Andy was saying about looking at longer, heavier trains and what I just mentioned about running uh, trains on peak uh, passenger paths through the channel tunnel. These are different ways of working. And if we can continue to be more efficient with our time and our resource and continue to review the policies and practice that we have internally to prepare us for our new normal, we can also then do that for our customers as well as they continue to emerge on their journey into their new normal. And that's something that we are very excited about. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much. That's really interesting and, uh, uh, and good to see that uh, you're finding not only that you're surviving at the moment, but that there's, there are upsides for you in, in the way that you're running your businesses. So I think that get, uh, brings us to the end of the presentations and leaves us with uh, 15 or 20 minutes to uh, take some questions and have some discussions. So Beth and Catherine, Andy, if you wanted to uh, reappear, so to speak, uh, come off mute and we can, um, we can start with some questions. So if you haven't sent in a question and you want to send in a question, you should have the functionality available to you to do that. So please do stick them in. Um, but I'm going to take uh, the chair's, chair's liberty and, and start with one of my own, because um, yesterday the Secretary of State Grant Shapps uh, was in front of the Transport Committee. Uh, as far as I can see from the, the transcript, he didn't talk for a very long about rail freight, uh, but he did talk quite a lot about the railways in general. And he was talking about the need for reform and for having what he described as a simpler timetable. So really, I wanted to offer up thoughts on what do we think that reform might be? Is it the Williams Review? Is it something different to the Williams Review? What might a simpler timetable mean? And is that an opportunity for freight? So, Bethan, I'm afraid I'm going to come to you first, seeing as he's your boss. Any thoughts? Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so I think in, in with regard to rail reform generally, um, it's probably worth just noting that government has said that it's committed to delivering it, uh, delivering some whole scale reform of, of the rail industry. But at the moment, the focus is, um, is clearly about COVID-19 and um, how to make sure that railways recover and get back to, um, to, to normal, as it were. Um, but um, I think that in relation to a timetable or a simplified timetable, um, I think if there's a really strong case, as I mentioned, to, to capitalise on the opportunity um, to press for rail freight to be um, uh, potentially prioritised in some in some um, of the timetabling process. Uh, as Andy talked about, um, there's a you know there's been. An, e an easier way of getting freight uh, freight voice heard with the, with the regions within network rail. I think government's um, government's voice is also behind that. Um, you know, prioritising freight uh, critical freight is is key. Uh, so I think that I would just say it's an opportunity um, to to capitalise on. Um, I can't give you any detail about any uh, Williams white paper or anything like that, but I, but I could say it's probably worth noting it's it's not likely to come in, in, in the short term, at least, while we're in the recovery phase of, of COVID-19. Okay. And Andy, from your point of view, you mentioned uh, regional engagement and, and getting network rails regions to um, to work effectively on rail freight. In your opinion, you know, what are the levers for unlocking that? I think we've all, you know, realised that journey. Uh, how do you think we go forward in a positive way? Yeah, I think, uh, good, 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 very good question, Maggie. It's one that, that you and I have talked about uh, over many conversations. I think it's it's one that I think is certainly the 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 ability and the focus that I think the regions have placed on freight um, during the during the COVID crisis has been has been superb. Um, and I guess you then put put a challenge back to say, well, why, how do we keep that going? What do we need to do? I think I think there's been a realisation with regional colleagues 
just how critical to the nation that rail freight has become. I get, I guess, from from obviously, you know, from their point of view, um, they having to balance up the the, the need to to um, deliver passenger and freight services, um, of which it'd be interesting to see when the uh, increase, the, the next step change in passenger timetable happens in the, in just over a week or so what that actually means for the amount of people traveling and of course the social social distancing distances has come down so again will that have an impact you know i i can't get i can't remember what the figures were i know there's been some bit of research done recently that seems to imply that uh, a number of employers are saying that many of their their employees may not go back into an office again ever so so depending upon how that plays out and, and where that is we may find that some parts of of the country find that um, the passenger footfall is much lower than it was before and I think until that probably comes back I think we just need to take stock and see what that looks like there are a lot of discussions going on behind the scenes with, with people on this call and people not on this call around what that might look like and, and I know there are some 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 thoughts on how that might look in the future but again I think we need just need to wait and see what what returns and then we can take a view but very much around trying to get regional engagement up try and get the the freight services we've got running longer continuing and also to go and push the boundaries and others as well because i think it's that's just the tip of the iceberg for me i think there's a there's a whole way we can make rail freight more efficient by running longer and heavier but it will be trade-offs between in many cases on some key corridors we share with passenger what are the economics between a passenger service and a longer freight train and catherine from your perspective what would be the uh the best things that Bethan and Andy could deliver for you in terms of that productivity gain? You know, I, I think, as, as I just mentioned, we've we've done an awful lot to prove our worth within freight over the past 12 weeks, and we've absolutely, as an industry, risen to that challenge. And it's now about making sure that we continue to be at the forefront and we do see some more prioritisation. We do need to keep our freight on rail and we, we do need to work together collaboratively as an industry. I think if we, you know, bold move, but if we could have targets for modal shift to promote more freight on rail, that would massively help us. That there are ways and means, but the fact that the support we've had so far in working differently has been a huge help. So we have run longer trains and heavier trains and trains through the channel tunnel. It's building now that momentum. We're at the forefront. Let's just keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. And some of your channel tunnel trains have been groundbreaking as well. And to you know, with the long history of the Channel Tunnel to actually launch a new service in the middle, biggest, middle of the biggest economic catastrophe most of us have ever seen was really quite something. So it was a little moment of joy exactly. for us all. And so well done. Thank you. Is, you know, these aren't these not weren't necessarily COVID related issues. This is our business as usual, just as being able to deliver the industry's needs, and we've been able to do it in the height of pandemic. Andy. Yes, yeah, sorry, Maggie. I was sorry, but I very remiss of me to say that the the regions have growth targets now for rail freight. So, so I probably should have put that out there to start with. We they do have regional targets. Clearly, at the moment, during the current problems, they 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 are a little bit um, behind those, but there's obvious reason for it. But certainly, once we are now back, well, when we get back to uh, to nearer to 100%, we'll be applying the pressure. And as I, as you probably know, there's been some trials recently. Um, there's been some some new trains, right? What newer trains running? There's a first train into New Haven last week with, with DB, and in fact, the the very attractive looking locomotive with the vinyls on the side that um, that Catherine showed was actually the first train down there. I actually live very close to New Haven, but unfortunately was already on a very long meeting, which I was a bit disappointed about. But uh, that just shows that even amongst this, the operators and the end users are looking towards the future. And I think we should we should do nothing more than support and applaud what they're doing. And certainly I want to see more of that. And my team are there to help and willing to support. Brilliant. Thank you. Right, we've got a question in on the chat. Uh, we mentioned that the Treasury is looking for shovel ready schemes to boost the economy. What are your thoughts on the appropriate schemes in support of rail freight that ought to be on that list? You can be as specific or as general as you like. Catherine. Um, so Bethan's already talked about MSRS and track access and um, freight access. These are all things that, that are great and they are helping us at the moment. We've also taken advantage of furlough. Unfortunately for DB, a lot of the government schemes haven't really been able to support us so at the moment anything that we're currently working on is a is a great help so yeah track access extensions uh, msrs they all help us okay and andy in terms of schemes on the network where would you go 
Well, of course, we well, I think there's, there's a couple of things here, isn't there? There's, there's I think some of the, the I mentioned about New Haven last week. But I think there's some terminal developments that we could we could look to bring in fairly quickly. And I think there's a number of uh, guy Bates in my team who many on the call will know is is my lead person for the business development and, and uh, new new business type activity. And he's working closely with our end users and, of course, our freight operators to see how we can manoeuvre and, and deliver some of those schemes. So very keen to do some of those. Obviously, through the Sheet Freight Network, there is, and, and obviously the equivalent in Scotland, there's a pipeline of projects, but clearly um, they take longer and require more money. So I think we should be looking at things that we can deliver quickly, work very closely to understand what the sector needs now, because, of course, those priorities may well have changed for the end users, and we need to be very much in listening mode to understand whether that is indeed the case. Bethan, I guess you're not going to tell us what's on the list, but uh, any thoughts about the kind of, of topics that are resonating with ministers? Uh, yeah, um, I think that uh, the key things should really be the focus on you know, how, what, what does this tie into in terms of broad, other strategies and broader strategies. So here we, we you can, can combine um, recovery with the green recovery here um, and looking to uh, Ne uh, traction decarbonisation network strategy. So, what what are the key things that, you know, with capital infrastructure investment, you'd unlock uh, huge decarbonisation benefits? I think that that's got to be a priority. Um, and uh, completely agree that the, the the SFN pipeline of projects is is absolutely the right place to start um, because it's already a list that's been developed in consultation with industry. Uh, but there is definitely um, a challenge for uh, for us within DFT and Network Rail to pro to um, to speed things up as as quickly as possible. So you're, even though it might not be shovel ready per se, you could move things along uh, quicker. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, lovely. I mean, I know we've been talking to you about infill electrification and the old chestnut of Trans Pennine and uh, getting freight back in there. So hopefully, yeah, that pressure can uh, can come forward. And I think you know, I always reflect, Minister, as well that. Whilst um, you know shovel ready is is relevant to all sectors, if we move, if we're building these rail freight trains, and actually even if we're building roads, that can cause rail freight trains to grow if we're moving construction materials. So uh, yeah. it's all good good news, I think, in that. Uh, a question here for Catherine: um, is, uh, What's been your uptake in new technology, which to help you talk differently to your customer, to your employees and customers, and uh, what are the lessons in that going forward? You know, how has technology helped you? Technology has helped us massively, Maggie. So I, I think I mentioned we are every single one of our colleagues is now technologically enabled. And if there are any pockets that aren't, we're now looking at ways to get them new technology. So we all have laptops, phones, tablets, something that six months ago not all of our workforce did. We're also using different platforms, so we're using online methods. We also have an app which we've increased the use of our football through. Um, we use different, we use videos, emails, newsletters. So we we really have widened our scope in terms of talking to our people, and that's that that really has been critical to us managing through this, being able to have a technological solution for each of our colleagues to access instant information. It's also enabled us to talk more to our customers as well. Brilliant. So what's next? What's the next tech? Ah, who knows? <laughs> Look, we've just got phones and laptops, Maggie. Come on, we're a railway company. <laughs> It's yeah. you know so there you go. challenge for all you technology people listening in to come up with the next piece of kit. The question about um, about planning actually, and uh, I know this is something in DB space, but have we got you know is this an opportunity to refine the engagement uh, with planning authorities? Are we going about that the right way? Uh, what has passed you know because I know planning reform is also on government's list. What should be our messages on that? Perhaps Andy and Catherine, have you any thoughts? Ladies first. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Tough question. But for example, your experience at Crickle has been that uh, getting planning over the line can be quite a challenge. It, what would make that easier? Yeah. Um, so making that easier would be where so so rail freight's been a dominant factor in that. You know, sites where where with rail freight connectivity that would help us massively. And obviously we want to grow our business. We're looking at sites that we can use differently. So yes, rail freight connectivity through planning would massively help our business. 
And Andy, from the point of view of the freight estate? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've got we've obviously got a large freight estate that we're, we're as I mentioned mentioned Guy's name earlier. Very keen to to see to see we use it more. Um, I think as Catherine and I have been talking about, particular in the London sites recently, you know, we we need to be seen to be good neighbours. We need to be we need to be promoting exactly why we have to have rail freight connectability and rail freight terminals in. In urban cities, I mean, you know, the more the more difficult it becomes because of restrictions on road, the more important I think the rail can play its part in moving goods into into major major cities. Clearly, the the property and estate side, as you know, Maggie and others on the call will know, is that that becomes more difficult because those packages of land that are still in railway ownership are, are have diminished over many many years. So those sites we currently have, we need to see how we can be clever in creating some some very um, thoughtful ways of delivering those for rail freight but I think we need to do that and I think we need to push back with the planning authorities in many cases to see and to demonstrate why these can be exactly you know exemplar locations that rail freight can can thrive on. Yeah thank you I absolutely agree getting particularly at the local level um, and local planning as well as, as the larger sites um, is particularly important I think. Okay we've, we've got a couple of minutes left so a final question that's coming then uh, as we move forward with passenger demand, should be the priorities for the next few weeks and months that we should be working on? Besson, perhaps uh, so, unfair to ask you first, but I'm going to. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I think priorities for the next few weeks, uh, it's, it's got to be about the operational um, uh, railway. Um, the, yeah, clearly there's, there's um, a need to make sure that we we get that balance right in the timetable um, and that we don't kind of go backwards. Uh, I think that's absolutely essential as a priority. Um, and then obviously I've talked quite a lot about the kind of the package of other things. So I think those are still worth working through um, in the kind of more policy regulatory space. Uh, but I think the absolute top priority for, for the short term is, is the operational side. Right, Andy? Yeah, I, I think um, supporting what Bethan said there, really, the focus for, 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 for me, really, and the team is to is to think about how we can operationally both get the longer services that we've been running at much longer lengths, sort of BAU, um, and get those back in the timetable, get the associated rights and everything around that, and basically look to move on to the next list. I want to really push hard on this. I think I think there is going to, as I mentioned, I've got enough clues, is I think there will need to be some trade-offs because there's going to be some very difficult um decisions need to be made trading off between you know a, a one or two coach passenger train potentially and a 775 meter long freight train so it's been kind of a place that I think we've all been thinking and we always talk about it at conferences Maggie about that kind of challenge that dilemma but I think we're now reaching a bit of a, of a, a, a crescendo of where that needs to, where this conversation is heading and I think that's not a bad thing but we need to have some grown-up discussions with the wider industry about we hate how we make best use of capacity and how we make best use of this opportunity. Thank you and finally you Catherine in terms of DB's Thank business. You completely agree with everything Beth and Andy have said so far so freight prioritisation on the network has to be a priority now for the next week weeks ahead and indeed going forward longer trains heavier trains looking differently at passenger prioritization really has to be a focus and it's something that we've started and we've started it really well in a pandemic but it's now how do we take that forward together collaboratively brilliant thank you all so it's at exactly 11 o'clock um where we we said we'd wrap up there and i think we've had a really interesting discussion both about the the strategic position but also some of the tactical interventions that are possible and being worked on to really try and cement improvements in productivity and in growth into the timetable over the remainder of this year. And I, you know, thank you to colleagues who are working hard to try and make that a reality. Getting the productivity of rare rate enhanced uh, can only be a good thing. So it just uh, ends for me to say a huge thank you to Beth and to Andy and to Catherine for their time today to all of you online for your questions and of course to Waterfront uh, for working with us on this uh, webinar. Uh, if you are interested in rail freight, uh, we will be running some webinars going forward at RFG, so have a look out from there. If you are not a member of Rail Freight Group and you'd like to be a member of Rail Freight Group, please do uh, drop me a line and we can give you some more information. Or indeed, if you had a burning question and you weren't able to get an answer to it on the webinar, please just do pop it through and we'll try and get that answered for you. Uh, offline. But thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.